Good morning to everybody. Um, we decided um, to make a small conversation with my colleague Christian that um, he plays with Musica Eterna, he is the first horn. And we usually, before and after the concerts, we have many conversations about Beethoven in private. And not only about Beethoven, about interesting things. And instead to make a kind of cliche conversation, Theodore, do you like Beethoven? How you feel when you conduct Beethoven? <laughs> we decided <laughs> all these difficult questions that are impossible to answer. So we decided to improvisate and to make... Oh, but, uh, he has questions here. <laughs> what will be the tempo in the second movement? <laughs> so uh, we decided to just to build a conversation with Christian and with you. Because what is interesting for us is to know how you feel. Because of course we do the music for heaven and for our souls and for the composer. But in fact, you are the main motivation to, to share something, to come in a kind of um, different type of communication as we have every day. So that's actually our little improvisation for, for today. So does it work like this? Okay, fantastic. Thanks uh, to, for coming, all of you. Thanks, Theo, for giving the time and the possibility for this talk. Um, I would, so we got uh, like in a structure, we should like 20 minutes talk to each other and then open, of course, at any time you can ask your questions. I would like to... You can interrupt if you want also. Yes. Because this can take long, <laughs> this comment. <laughs> I would like to ask you a first question, which is uh, so obvious because everybody is asking, so Ninth Symphonies and next recording and in Salzburg. Why? What is your approach? What, what do you think if you think of Nine symphonies of Beethoven, probably you know all recordings which are existing since recordings exist. You know descriptions from performance of this uh, 18th and 19th century. So what, how you approach this in very big project? First of all, um, I must say that it was not my idea to make the Nine symphonies. In, um, that was an idea of Markus Hinterhäuser. And Marcus is a person that I trust. To be honest, uh, when I was, um, uh, when we decided to record all the symphonies, let's say, take two months and record the whole symphonies, I was not a great fan of this idea because what is the problem is that every symphony is another, is a different world. It's not a story that Beethoven starts, you know, and continues. It's not a serial of uh, symphonies. Every symphony establishes uh, a unique world of understanding and you need reflection also to what is happening in the world. So you need really to be concentrated in every symphony. Even in the fact that you play two symphonies in one, uh, in one day and you need to really to switch. We played Two days ago, you remember, you pl we played number one and then number three. That's so different. I mean, it's difficult sometimes to imagine that it's the same human being and composing these uh, two symphonies. Of course, you can find an in an identity in that, but the spectre is so different. So uh, you need also to change the sound and you need... It's not only the spirituality of the sound, because the sound, you know, many people say, oh, there is this orchestra that has this certain sound, and this orchestra has this certain sound. I don't agree with it. This is a little bit mythology for writing good articles. Each composer needs his own sound. So the good orchestra is the orchestra that can really create this environment, that the composer can build the architecture idea that he has. The problem with uh, nine symphonies is that if you play, let's say, in two weeks all the symphonies, the struggle is to um, to live from the one symphony to the other. My problem is I was very concerned this morning because I 
in my dream, I conduct the Ninth Symphony. I said, come on, Theodore. I mean, you conducted the third, you conducted the second. It was another concert because that's a kind of effect after the concerts. You cannot, uh, this music, you get possessed with this music. But uh, still number nine. So it is difficult. And you remember the next day of the rehearsal of number nine, difficult to switch to the first symphony. So difficult. Because it's not only, it's not only the composer, it's every work, every Symphony has its own color, has its own language, so because it's a different story behind it. And um, your your critics um, find you super extreme. And I've read one of the critics after the Ninth Symphony, and um, for example, one thing is uh, the tempi. They are questioning the tempi. You find it super fast. And for us, of course, so I need to, to tell this question, ask this question, but. Um, just to make it clear which where you're coming from, how you choose the tempi, which are obviously super extreme. Who is the extremist in this game? Uh, I would give you the same question, but maybe you work with me. So tell the truth, I mean, <laughs> yes. the because they will like not believe me <laughs> <laughs> if I was say. <laughs> okay, let's <laughs> do like this. Okay, it, um, to be honest, it is not Theo's choice to uh, the tempi because Beethoven had a metronome for all symphonies and he asked for this tempi. It's written about above any uh, movement, a metronome. And if you try to perform it, you will struggle <laughs> because it's the fast tempi are often super, super fast. And it's, it's not the Theo who asked for this super fast tempi or for an effect, it's Beethoven who asked this, and we are in a grown, grown up in a quite romantic um, um, atmosphere and approach to classical and Baroque music. And now if you go to the source and see what, what did the composer want, then you see, hey, wow, he was a very clear idea about the tempo. And if you change this tempo, you find it makes a completely different effect on the music and a completely different story because it's, if it's super fast it's like a picture you are far away and you see more structures and you perceive in a very different way so it's not Theo who is extremist it's um, Beethoven <laughs> um, another question I must give you so I, I like to take interviews so another question I want to give also to you is what you believe what would be your first feeling if you would, about extremi extremity now, I'm going to talk. Um, in some ways, um, let's say, we know a monument, right? Notre Dame, Parthenon, Athens. And uh, we interpret, uh, of course, the value of this monument through decadence. That means, through the view we have our certain moment in history, um, to this monument. That means Parthenon is white and Notre Dame was black. Now it's white, but Notre Dame is black, right? Uh, and we, that's something, I mean, when we bring um, the Parthenon or the, city, oh, the white marble, the association of our brain, the black stone. Now, uh, of course, we build all our aesthetic and all our, let's say, uh, understanding and language of understanding through a, a certain uh, basis that we, we accept. Things like that, Parthenon and Notre Dame. Now, I must say you uh, that actually Parthenon was not white when it was built. It what is of all golden with red and blue and... Well, you would find it very kitschy, actually, in your days. And Notre Dame was white, of course. Uh, when I saw Notre Dame, to be honest, because I tested with myself white after the restoration they did, I didn't like it. I found, it, I, I found that they destroyed the monument I loved. But after a certain conversation um, I had with people is um, that we used to love what we believe we know. And, um, and if 
this what we believe we know in something else, we have difficulties. What I can suggest is to give a little time for that. I mean, to use um, all these huge contrasts that are in the symphonies of Beethoven, that are all written after the moderated, uh, the, the moderation of time that falls like a, a cloud, you know, to the piece of art, you know, it gives this patina. And we start through this decadence to interpret it, and the source. Uh, if we want to see and to be in contact with the original, uh, how was the, the monument after its building, the next day after its building, we need a little bit to give, give time to switch our, um, um, our minds and to be a little bit more um, liberated for the aesthetics of our times. Because this, actually this is um, uh, it's not about aesthetic, it is about another type of communication that we try to the narrow ways of aesthetic to put it in and try to, um, to create reflections with that. So that's impossible. Live with the Parthenon full color. These colors, it, it was all the scientists they said it was like a technicolor monument. And try to live one week there and then return to this white marble, to the ruins and find um, uh, this conversation. This is about extremity that we're, we are talking. So in a way it's really necessary to, yeah, to take off the patina. And we, of course we are playing on, on historic instruments um, with scat strings and uh, all these um, things which were not in the Romantic orchestra already invented. But uh, even if we try to approach how it could have been, it's anyway necessary to take off the patina or to, to change, like Marlott or Wagner changed Beethoven's, um, Beethoven's orchestration for what you said, the extreme, um, the extreme dynamics masking. Um, uh, Beethoven is asking Wagner and Mahler change the orchestration to, to make it clearer. The, the strings became more and more because the halls became bigger and bigger. So, and then they found the relation between strings and winds didn't work, so they arranged, rearranged in a way, in the way. Yes, they doubled the winds or, or changed the instrumentation from bassoons to horns, from so parallel to the exposition of the, for example, of the fifths. There are many things. So com compared with this, you are super conservative, <laughs> because you, you you play like like it's um, like Beethoven asked. Even if we have a much bigger halls, so you try to approach from a different way, but you try to get rid of the patina to have the a similar effect. What the people could have felt when they heard Fifth Symphony or Eroica, this baff, baff, you start to double urknall with a, with a um, big bang with two chords and you're immediately in a, in a new world. So this must have been a shock. So it's a, it is for you a question, how can I, how can I um, bring to the audience this effect of music more than authenticity or tradition? First of all, authenticity, um, you know, when we, were, when we make a research in the, um, um, for Beethoven symphonies, and we even find in some parts there were some indications solely. For Fifth Symphony, it was Fifth Symphony. I said solely what that means. And we started. So then we found that it was um, um, most of the musicians were amateurs. And, uh, and there were some professional, so the amateurs they couldn't play a certain place. I so said, please don't play that, let the, the professionals play, and then you come in in a kind of tutti. That doesn't mean that is not authenticity for me to create a kind of... to ask the composer the day of the performance to make the overture for uh, Opera Don Giovanni and then in a fast tempo to, to play the whole articulation. This, that's not the... Authenticity. Authenticity is a little bit needs um, a kind of, of course, a knowledge of history, of the piece and of the environment. 
and of the tendency of, of the moment that it was composed, but also needs a kind of instinct to get in contact with um, what the composer wanted. Not how, in fact, was performed, but what was his goal. And that's a problem, because, as an example, I'm composing music. Um, if, um, if I will ask somebody, somebody takes my piece to, to perform it, and he makes a performance, but they not enough rehearsals, the orchestra was not good, it was, and didn't, didn't work. Didn't work. But I was in the rehearsals, and I was trying to help, to give indications and things like that, but it didn't work. Then after 100 years, somebody found this recording and said, that's the way this piece has to be played. Theodore was there. Was. So you see, it is, we need really be to be clever in these things. We need to understand which is the goal of the composer and what is what happened. But what happened is not, 90%, what happened is not the goal of the composer the intention of the composer, the target. So we need really be to have this instinct uh, to, 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 to go there. Also with the metronomes. The metronomes gives you a kind of general idea how will be the central um, move of the, of, the, um, of the movement. But um, also, I must tell you something. If the, you, will, you will ask me to put a certain metronome to my own music, I would, I would, uh, I would never put a metronome like Mahler did. He never puts, very rarely puts a metronome, because he understands that a metronome without um, inner instinct to know when, how, how you move this metronome inside the piece is also dangerous. But uh, for Beethoven, it was necessary because even now, with the evidence of metronome, there are people that say, oh no, it was a double metronome it, because it's the bell and it's the acremes and, and et cetera, et cetera. So everything has to be twice uh, slower because we have evidence of the broken metronome of the 19th century. And there are different, different, different theor theories. Can you imagine what would be if he wouldn't put a metronome? Now, uh, mostly of the post-romantic performance, they simply, almost half of the tempo, the slow movements, they, they, they have been performed half of, of its own tempo that is written. So the music is different, the, the music changes. So uh, it's very important in one way, historically, to obey and give time to yourself to see what was the plan of the monument, and a little bit to stay from your love of the mon monument that you believe you know, and try to appreciate what you don't know. I did an experiment when we did the recording, Christian, I didn't tell you. We were checking in the backstage again the metronome. I was singing with the metronome, conducting with the metronome, and Giovanni and the sound engineer and uh, Max came in telling I think 2% down will be the best, because I feel you then, or maybe 4% down. So you think so? It's for the Seventh Symphony. Said, I tried 4% down, he said, well, yes, you're right. I have a little bit more space to breathe with that. It's not so tight. Okay, we agreed the metronome, and then we went to the recording. And then I stand in front of the orchestra and we said, let's start. And we start, when we start, say, Theodore, what, what happened with the metronome? You are, I play the whole piece. You are exactly in the author, in Beethoven's metronome. You cannot go forward down. That was very weird. But 10 years I have used to play with this metronome, I mean, to meet this metronome. And for me, it's already natural. Doesn't shock me the colored Parthenon and the white Notre Dame, because I, I was living in front of this place and I see it every day. But I could imagine if I wouldn't see every day this, it would be oh, this is extreme, and this is this, and this is this. 
Of course, the, the Tempe, this is the tempo of a piece you chose or Beethoven chose. This is something very obvious on the surface. Everybody will immediately get, oh, they are playing super fast. But for me, it's interesting that even in the, where the, the tradition meets the Beethoven tempo or any composer's uh, tempo or the expectation of our romantic education, so music journalists or critics find still you, something in your way of playing irritating, extreme and irritating, and it's not easy to say what it is. So even for me, when we, when we listen to the Mahler recording you recently did, it is something in it what is some really irritating in a way that, uh, that I thought Things are, so we have the, the score and we transpose it to a performance. And then we have the performance, we listen and we need to get an inner picture. So we, everybody needs to create an inner movie to understand the sound. So it's not just a, like the street because it's a meaning in every note. We transpose it in an inner, inner movie and then we get the story the composer probably want to tell or I imagine my story, what I hear in the music. So, but the, Many of the recordings, also like Tchaikovsky, it, something is what I expected. It's only possible in mind. It's you can somehow grab it from a tablet recording. <laughs> what this? It's something what I find irritating. Is fascinating. It's becoming like an organism. The music, you know, like something living. What do you think is the? So is it a is it a conscious uh, concept? Is it your personal approach? What do you think is irritating for, for listeners? Even if you can't say it's an extreme tempo or it's an extreme dynamic, is something in it what it is? As, as you well know, while we're rehearsing a piece, I never try to provocate or to things. We really try to set the line and the architecture of the piece and to open them. But this, what you say, and we are not extreme in dynamics or things like that. But the people find something irritated. What I really believe, it is a little bit, it's a psychological effect, is when you open a certain space. And this is in contradiction of what you say about the inner movie. That's a kind of um, um, an old romantic practice that they have people, uh, as an example, he plays Troimerai, and I remember my grandmother when I was a boy, that she was sitting with me in a fireplace, and I cry. That's, that's a, a simple, you know, uh, Bernard, movie, Bernard yeah. Shaw <laughs> was crying when he was listening uh, Troimerai, but then when he was old, he was crying also in different pieces because he thought that it was Troimerai. <laughs> So, um, but you know, it's not the inner movie I'm talking about. No, no, I know, yes, no, okay. no. Uh, I would like to just to have to make a joke. So, um, I think um, the most important thing and the key of the energy is to find the right key to the right door. I mean, the goal is to open the door of the perception, the channel, the space. And um, most of the times the door is not opening in our, um, in our lives. We just, we are relaxed, we listen something, and relaxed we answer, and then we go relaxed home, and then next day we hardly remember what happened yesterday. It's this kind of this. I hardly believe that that was the target of Beethoven and of, course of Wagner or Mahler. I hardly believe. I mean, the, of course, they would like to open the cosmic uh, space of the energy, the Dionysian and the, and the Apollonian, this couple in, in the right dissonance and proportion and symphony also inside, and get... Uh, the unknown outside, the transcendental experience and what is happening. For doing that, you need, there is no 
receptor. I, I, I don't. I cannot say. If you play a little louder than you played now, this will create um, um, ecstasy. And now, if you go a little slower, more pianissimo here, this will create love. This is not happening. So, what is heritated? What you say? It is how do you create a kind of preparation during the rehearsal time for people to breathe and, and when, when they inhale in the concert, I mean, to, to dive in the limits of their human possibilities, to make people to get their limits. Because even fantastic orchestra, fantastic musician, that he can play anything, in good intonation, in tune, with fantastic sound and nuance and everybody. If he's not approaching his limits, then you cannot open the door. It is decorative art. Okay, um, I can um, confirm that he was going to the limits <laughs> of the musician <laughs> and of herself. No, it's, I, ne I never saw it this way. It's very interesting. So, so it's not you would say it's not, it's less all the technical aspects, it's the human aspect. You, you ask from yourself, from us, to play and to risk whatever is possible. And we are going on the edge all the time, the performance, doing the performance to give, yeah, to go to the limits of every we can, everything we can feel and that we are working in the rehearsal. And this is, you think this is irritating effect of the Exactly. To the people, exactly. which exactly. yeah, exactly. because we exactly. open the their limits of the the limits of of the uh, expectation of uh, or what is it, what the what people could feel before they need to feel more because we feeling strong as we can and that it's yeah. like this. Of course, yes. Uh, if you cannot convince somebody for something if you don't believe that. To that. I mean, faith is the most important thing. If you believe something, and you, if, if the music is playing loud inside you, somebody, there is a hope that somebody will listen. I mean, all these, if you see um, all these angels in the ceilings of the opera houses, and all these Apollos, with, and all these muses with the harps, it's not just an aesthetical um, point of view of a kind of a renaissance and and etc. It's an idea that has been decorative to our times, but it was not decorative uh, in the beginning. There is spirit. If you believe to the spirit, there is. If you believe that there is something else, there is a transcendental experience. You believe. If you believe that there is an energy, then you need to, to be in contact with these natures. Why we have to isolate and to try to find something? Ah, oh, this is has a lot of energy. This is not classical music. Or oh, this is has to. Um, be, what is energy? I sto pianissimo. It is stupid, I think. So let's change uh, spot to the conversation. <laughs> so um, I can say you are often described as a classic rebel revolutionary and we talked the other day and um, for me you said something very interesting you said the revolution is just about the revolution and it's not for a goal in this sense i'm not at all you are not at all a revolutionary because you don't want to deconstruct something you want to construct something you want to go somewhere and um so um your your idea of this greek uh, ancient theater so uh, you ask questions. This is very, very uh, narrow, connected with this, um, with, with what we're talking, which is irritating. So you go, we go on stage, and we open emotions, and you don't have the expectation to give answers or to give something complete, ready, untouchable. So what you said, we can, we can only see in the, in the during the performance what will happen. How is the audience reacting on it, on it? But on this sensation of music. So it is on the psychological view. So it's your approach much more psychological than just musicologistic approach. How conscious is this psychological part? I must say that uh, 
I really, I truly believe, and I, I would like that you would believe me, that uh, the musician, the role of the musicians is to put new questions to the audience. The musician cannot give answers because he doesn't know. And uh, uh, when you can give an answer, that's the end. The musician and uh, the person in the orchestra, let's say, like this, if you, from ancient theater we go, what is orchestra? Orchestra is the place when sits the chorus of the, you know, is the stage and there is the orchestra and the kingdom. And from that place, the chorus of the ancient tragedy participates in between the suffering protagonist and uh, the audience. So it's this bridge that gives the questions and the theater never closes because it's a question to the eternity. And when the theater closed, the Colosseum, then the lions should eat the gladiators and the Christians. That's what, what became Sophocles and uh, after the close of this. I said, we have the answer. And the theater become this, the gladiators. So um, the open theater and the open stadium is always the question. And you, that you are in between the person, the audience, and the stage, that is the myth, you have to renew the question, to refresh the questions. And in every evidence and every things that we see, to give much more questions. And that's, um, uh, that's a kind of um, psychological attitude that can help the human being to be in front of a kind of apocalypse of, of drama. That drama is not something that you achieve, the understanding of drama is a kind of inner apocalypse, even a revelation, inner revelation. With the music, is that that is important. To after a performance, through the energy that you transfer to the people, these people trying to find new questions to give about about himself. Even it's not I like or I don't like. This is what is wrong for me in music. This is. Ah, this I like, ah, this is I don't like. That's wrong. It is sometimes is more um, important to get not with the aesthetic or not with the morality of good and bad, but just, I, I cannot, you cannot say I like, I like my, um, let's say my liver. You cannot say that. I mean, it's, it's something that works. It's not something that it is. So I like my liver, I like my... So better uh, than judging I like or I like not, or it's con confirmed by something. Is if I'm irritated and if, I'm, if I feel something strange in it, I can ask myself why it is. So what asked the music, what asked Theodore, what asked the musician? This is not what? Theodore, there is no Theodore, in, in the, there is not even music. Why I feel and why I'm, I'm who I am in that moment. That's the important thing. Okay, the personal question of any, everybody of us. So I get a, a sign, a hint from the back seat <laughs> that uh, it's not, not very easy to get into our conversation, I guess. <laughs> and we should perhaps conscious wise open now a space for, for questions from the audience. When and where did you record the Beethoven cycle? When and where you did record uh, the Beethoven cycle with Musica Eterna? I recorded just two symphonies for the moment. That was last uh, two weeks ago in the Wiener Concert House. Which number? Which number? Five and seven. We used, uh, no, uh, not with the metronome, we use the metronome all the time. We play with the metronome because we, it's uh, really important to that everybody will it would be not something to use and not to be artificial, but to record with the metronome you cannot because you listen the click. So, 
practice a lot for the metronome. Yes, yes. And, uh, and for the people that they haven't practiced with the metronome, it's a very funny thing, because sometimes you feel that the metronome is accelerating or is slowing down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like you said the other day, the metronome is drunk, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's very interesting. If, if, if you really go to this tempo, like dan, dan, din, dan, dan, or which is really surprisingly slow, it's not always the fast tempo, but the, the last movement of Seventh Symphony, when we played first time together, so it's super exhausting for the winds, and you're like, yam, 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 para, and you go, it's quite easy here. Yeah? Beethoven's tempo is dum 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 It's an agonic state in a way, and to keep this, you really it is very very difficult to keep like 12 or 14 minutes in somehow a very very similar state of of musical expression. And if you do it with a metronome that forces you not with by tempo to make an, an an effect or an expression, but you really are forced to give it from yourself, and this is really super tiring. So it's really a hard work and very useful to really use this temp, this uh, metronomes, to yeah. show what can I give, what I have to give to have the expression. We also did something interesting. Uh, we record the seventh symphony in pure analog with a tape and will be only in analog to analog, the AAA. And um, in the major labels from the beginning of 80s, they have no record in pure analog. Because we want to start um, that the people will return to the value of the beautiful sound. Uh, now we have to one, two, three. So yes. <clears throat> I have a question about uh, the instruments because uh, you said uh, in order to achieve the, the, the perfect goal of what composer uh, intend to achieve, uh, of course, uh, uh, at the time of uh, composing the, the piece, uh, maybe technique was not uh, well, uh, not by not only by performers but also uh, instruments itself is not perfect, then uh, if the musician's technique are developed and then also at the same time uh, instruments have been developing, then why not uh, using, uh, uh, why do you stick to use the original uh, period of instruments in order to achieve the goal? That is first my question. And the second question is maybe you, you, ha you have been asked many times but about uh, performing uh, with uh, standing. Uh, is this uh, music impact or is this because of uh, your historic analysis of performing uh, style of the orchestra? That is my second question. Thank you. Uh, first of all, um, historical instruments is not because we want to... It's a different sound and sounds better. I have played with modern instruments in Beethoven and with the same musicians with historical and the same musicians sound in a different way. I'll give you one small example. You see this St. Peter, this... Um, this. Um, if we want to beat another St. Peter now, an architect can tell me, this will be very expensive. We have to take the stone, it's all made of stone, it's an old stone, and to put, and this is not convenient, will it gonna be cold? It's not going to be very symmetric, gonna have problems. Let's do it with cement. And then I will paint you on the top, and will be the same. And when when you do it, do it with cement near this, and one will be masterpiece with the defects. This one that you see, and the other will be, you know, I don't want to say the word how it would be, but you understand. St uh, starts with S in all the languages, European languages, <laughs> because uh, this is real and the other is fake. And then, in 100 years, maybe why not to play with electronic uh, instruments? These instruments can be also better. But they're not going to be the same instruments anymore. May I say some word? So for me, as a home player, it's very, very easy to, to answer this question because we could use the Valfrons, of, co of course, it's obvious, but we don't do... One argument for me is Beethoven probably minimum until 
1820 never listened, though he could not listen, no, for sure he never listened to a valve horn because he was not, he had, didn't have the capacity when the valve was invented. So, but if you see how he is using the, the natural horns, it is, colors. yes, with a stop, with this half stop, with this color. So just like uh, the, in the Eroica, for example, uh, the, if, if you have a dissonant chord, ya -ba -ba -ba, it's a stop note. And this, this pressed sound of, is on this, this septima chord is just a, such a strong effect. And then you open wah, to, this, to the open sound. So you can really understand the good composers of his time, of this time. They, they just didn't write a, a, a score like, like, I don't know, on the piano. They listened to the orchestra and they never listened something different than a natural horn or a flute with less keys. Or, so they knew about the difficulties. And if they approach a musical effect like super high flute, super high oboes, they knew that it's how it would sound and that you would struggle to get it. Yeah? And this is part of, you can't, you can't um, remove it from their expectation how it will sound if they listen in their inner ear before they write it down. So if Mozart's writing an overture in like five minutes or two hours, he must have it ready in his in his perce inner perception. So what did he listen? Not a valve horn, because it was not invented. For me, it's one of, of very clear argumentation. It is deeply connected to the music and not to aesthetics. All this in the ninth century, how you, you have to do it with Boucher to get this sound. A standing performance is simply better. I mean, why the soloists don't sit down? Because they need a little more space to move, and it's 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 more powerful, and it is. Um, you have the space to. It it is it is simply, and the sound is better, and everything is better. It's very. Um, you mentioned in an interview, maybe half a year ago, that you were working with a lot of different music scores and with the help of music scientists and put in your own corrections uh, because you found a lot of mistakes in, the, in different scores. Doesn't mean that you kind of created your own edition at the end? And where did you get them? Like, and why did nobody uh, do the same work before, like before you? No, uh, I don't have my... Uh, I just... I'm in contact with uh, people that they do critical editions, and they ask me also if I found the mistakes and new comments about the uh, about the pieces because we are doing that. So I give my comments to people that they are the masters of the critical editions. Um, but in fact, I have uh, my own editions, but this is not something that has to do with the literature and uh, with the weird things, um, um, a kind of different collections of scripts and um, things like that, but not, not uh, music scores. Sorry? Uh, by what publishing house do you take these critical editions? Where is published? Different, different um, famous uh, publishers. Like, um, we, we work with Universal, we work with Berliner Reiter, we work with. But uh, uh, simply as an example now with uh, Mahler, that, uh, because we discover that it's very difficult to find mistakes. And we still find mistakes. Here, as an example in Beethoven, there are many questions because in the first time was eighth note, in the second time is a quarter note. Um, what is happening? And uh, and I did all this in experimental way. I think I'm the only one that tried to do that. As an example, if you remember um, when we were playing um, uh, the scherzo, that I told you, okay, first bar. First two bars with the nails and then the tache. Because it's written when it comes every time the same thing. And I saw the in the manuscript that is so dirty, it is all done like this. And Beethoven would never write such such kind of detail to every instrument, you know, he was kind of general dynamic. 
but this is put it in all the instances. So maybe there is a special reason. So I, I say the orchestra, let's try, unlikely, but let's try to to do to do that. I mean to play two bars with the names and then detaché, two bars with the detaché, to find this. Uh, it was in the Sixth Symphony. In the Sixth Symphony. And um, things like that are very important and through experience and instinct you can find. But why the first time he wrote like this and exactly pre reprinted this bar in another time is not like this. Here there are three nails and there are two nails. Is that true? Is, some, is there a meaning on that? So you need a little bit to be, to find out. Switching from Beethoven to two Austrian composers, famous Austrian composers of uh, symphonies. I mean, um, Franz Schubert, I think you like him very much, but uh, the other person is Anton Bruckner. What's your relation to him? Uh, some people say that uh, he is rather a local um, authority uh, since um, years ago, for instance, Toscanini or, or Bernstein didn't like him very much. Yes, and for Buchner, what is important, is, I think, is uh, even Mahler didn't know how to answer. It is very difficult to say, I like Bruckner. It's, it's difficult to say that. Um, Bruckner is, is a very special category in music himself. He is, in the way, a kind of um, an ancient composer. He's the same time a minimalistic composer. We have these loops all the time. He is a um, spiritualistic, romantic composer. Very strange thing. A um, moral romantic doesn't exist, but that is, that's Bruckner, <laughs> the only one, moral romantic. And um, I really believe that that's something really beautiful that happens with Bruckner. That he's not, of course, there are people that they adore Bruckner and they're connected with him. And there are people that they don't understand. I wish the, the same would be with Gustav Mahler, but now everybody's obliged to... I mean, to be a little bit not in the surface you can serve your work better. That's why you see um, Bruckner has um, better interpretations because the people that go for him, I mean, they are connected. You cannot just say, oh, let's say Bruckner, let's play a Bruckner symphony. No, you will never do that if you are not going for that. So it's very, very important. And I think um, personally, uh, I feel with the most of uh, his pieces connected with uh, Bruckner. That's why and uh, I do not very often. Do you want to record all the Beethoven symphonies with Musica Eterna? All nine? You want to record? Yes. <laughs> yes. I already did the two. Now we have still um, s uh, seven symphonies to record. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you talked about recording analog. How does this work out if I'm listening to this on iTunes? Because I couldn't find it yet on iTunes. I don't know when the, when the recordings are out. But is this still the right sound? Is this a fake? And then a completely different question. Let's just ask it if it's on my turn. How can you handle a composer like Wagner, for instance? Or how would you handle him? Because for me, he, was, he had visions. He did something for the future. And if you do this with his, the instrument he, that were used in his time, I mean, do you do him justice? or? 
isn't it more justice to him if you do it on modern instruments? Thank you. Yes, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, in this recording, the analog that we're doing, you will never listen in nine tunes. <laughs> because you, you have to buy a turntable and only, it will be only released in vinyl. But there will be a digital recording, different from the analog, the same piece, that you can listen in iTunes. This is done with less, it's almost live what it is, the analog, and it is, uh, will be done in, it's, with different miking, and it's, we, we record with both ways with different equipment. And of course, um, the digital will not be in, in vinyl, as they do now, because most of the vinyl that they're doing now is from digital to analog. So it is worse to the analog than the digital. It's better to listen on digital. But analog to analog, it's incredible sound. So that was the first. Then in Wagner, I think, um, you know, Wagner was um, somebody that really created instruments. And um, of course, it's a music of the future. I agree with that. And for me, it is always a great challenge to, to have a deal with uh, operas of Wagner. I really believe, if I, I would compare, I believe that, of course, it's better with the historical instruments. Because then, you get, you get more the inner power of music than the surface, the powerful surface of, of, um, of the contemporary orchestra. Let's say it's not so... Uh, it's darker, in a way. It sounds not so polished. and sounds more... Um, and has this kind of this smoke that there is inside. This is better. But it's not such, let's say, an extreme difference as it is um, the difference of doing, as an example, Mozart with contemporary instruments. Uh, that simply, that because mostly the instruments of the late, as they say, of the Parsifal, as an example, are quite closer to the instruments we heard in the 20th century, right? Uh, closer as a generation. Uh, if you play, um, let's say, Monteverdi with contemporary instruments, then this is, is not working at all. So the, uh, I prefer with historical Wagner as well, but... Perhaps I can... Uh, so for me, it's an, uh, as a horn player, we are in a, in a special situation because uh, we have an instrument which developed from natural horn to valve horn depending in which region, in which country, it took like 100 years. So uh, natural horn was um, a teaching position in Paris until 1909. So this is really, it's um, nearly 100 years after the first invention of the valve in 1814. So why couldn't the people give up the natural horn? So Brahms wrote all his, um, so the Brahms trio, for example, this wonderful, super complicated things, full of stop notes, Weber wrote his concertino, super virtuose, really, if you see it, it's not, it's not impossible to play it on a natural horn. So, but they wrote it explicit for the natural horn, why they did it. Wagner, if you speak about Wagner, in, um, in Flying Dutchman, he asked for two natural horns and two valve horns. So what they really agreed in, in France, for sure, and also in, also in German-speaking um, German uh, countries, they agreed absolutely that a valve horn is not a replacement for a natural horn. So with, um, to your question, we have the better instrument with, because it developed. We have a different instrument because it developed. And there I absolutely agree with Anand Kuo, who said, the instrument of the time mostly are the best for the music of the time. They fit best to the music for, for musical reasons. And then you can perhaps say, okay, after, after Flying Dutchman, he changed to for uh, Valfons, for he had reasons to give it up. He was missing something, so he invented the Wagner tuba between, uh, between the tuba and, and the uh, bassoon and horn. So he just created things. What, what he was missing was Theo was saying. So 
from this point of view, it's for me, it's a strong sign to to go on uh, ancient instruments. Of course, of course. How do you continue your work at the Salzburg Festival? I don't know. This is uh, Markus Hinderhäuser would tell you if this would have happened. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, we are waiting. We are waiting for the press conference on this subject. Soon, coming soon. <laughs> Perhaps um, other questions uh, more to be told at the occurrences. Marcus, uh, why we start with number nine? No, number nine, either you start or you finish. You know what, what, is, what is the most beautiful thing? That uh, the, the first symphony starts, is, is what is, it was amazing in the first symphony, is that it's the end of the symphonies. It starts with a kind of septaco tonica, and it's pumping, that was. He starts his symphonic with two chords with a, with a, a question resolution and that's it. and then he starts to develop all